God is good all the time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Can you hear me okay? When I was in Oregon, I frequented a particular gym, and I got to know a man named Stephen Bolin, and he was a devout believer and shared his faith very openly. He suffered from MS, and he wrote a little pamphlet and shared it with those who would even read it, and it goes like this. There was a time in my life when weakness wasn't even in my vocabulary. My drive to achieve played a big part in my becoming an Oregon All-State Wrestling Champion. Why I pushed myself academically to achieve a postdoctoral degree in jurisprudence and set up a successful law practice. But today my body is stricken by multiple sclerosis. The only thing certain about my future is uncertainty. I've had to learn with this, to live with this uncertainty. I've also learned to embrace the weakness that MS has inflicted on my life. Rather than trying to resist my weakness, I've learned to rest in it. Like most people, I have thought that great strength and accomplishments were the things to boast about, but I have been learning to boast instead about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. In my weakness, I've also found strength in Christ to encourage others, and I've discovered that there are very few people in the world who don't need encouragement. Weakness is now one of the most important words I know. In fact, did you know that weakness is the only condition that qualifies us for coming to God? Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So as we heard in today's epistle, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. We do this to edify the weak, to build up the weak. Another way of saying, restoring those of us who are broken by sin or despair. The Lord says, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. In the gospel, we heard about the healing of two blind men and a dem demoniac, manifesting perfectly the Lord's power in their weakness. His goodness, his compassion is as plain as day, and yet the juridical Pharisees oppose him and prefer to remain blind in their pursuit of worldly power, the opposite of the pursuit of weakness. But Jesus says to the blind men, according to your faith, be it done for you. There are several ways that God tests and builds our faith. You'll probably get tested on every one of them this week. Count on it. In fact, you will be confronted by all of them perhaps the same day. God tests our faith through difficulties. First Peter says, for a little while you have had to suffer great and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. God tests our faith through demands. He asks us to do things that are seemingly impossible. For example, in the New Testament, there are over 1,000 commands for believers to obey. Of all these commands, some of them seem unreasonable. unreasonable. Some, of them, some of them inconvenient. Some of them seem downright impossible. So what do you do when you have an impossible command that is presented like a demand. Let us recall Abraham. You remember his story. He was 75 years old and about to hang it up when God said, I want to take you somewhere to make a difference in the world. I want you to go somewhere where you've never been. You don't even know where you're going. Abraham asked, where exactly am I going? God says, I'll tell you. How am I going to get there, Abraham asks. I'll show you. How will I know when I get there, Abraham asks. When you get there, I'll tell you that you've arrived. How would you, like, how would you deal with a command like that? We might say, God, could I Google it first? I'd like to check it out. I'd like to get on a map quest 
and yet a point-by-point -point direction, then I'll be ready to follow your directions. Faith, indeed, is a risk. When it's a risk, it means you can't understand it all in advance. Why would God do that? He's not just interested in making us comfortable, helping us to see all directions and points on the map. And we know the result. Hebrews 11, 8, 8 by faith, Abraham obeyed, and he went. Finally, God tested faith through delays. If every prayer were immediately answered, if your every need were automatically met, if every problem were instantly solved, you wouldn't need faith, and your faith would be null and void. And at the end of the gospel, we heard Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. This past Friday, August 6, we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration. And recalling that particular verse Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him. The blind men's eyes were opened. Our eyes, as a result of the transfiguration, are open to the new reality of how God manifests his power by healing every disease and infirmity among the people, by assuming our brokenness, our weakness. So when our sight, eyesight is transfigured, normalized actually, it's impossible to be neutral towards Jesus. We can try and ignore him and even pretend such stories in the Gospels are simply myths. But the moment we allow for any room for the miraculous, our choice is either to respond to him with marvel, as the Gospel says, never was anything like this seen in Israel, or react as did the smug religious authorities with complete disgust and mistrust. These two healing miracles now set the stage for this pronounced dichotomy and a showdown. And there is no middle ground between those who are healed and those who are still in darkness. Between, between those who are open to receiving God's grace, again, power in weakness, and those who resist it between those who praise and glorify Christ and those who reject, blaspheme him. He casts out demons by the prince of demons, say the Pharisees. And finally, between those of us who are successful in the spiritual life, seeking to grow by God's grace, and those who remain of the world. So the formula for success, formation, is quite simple. First, follow him. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud. Second, ask him for help. Have mercy on us, son of David. And finally, believe in him. Do you believe that I am able to do this? This is the gospel of the kingdom we yearn for. That new community where Jesus manifests his power and his love for us in our weakness. This is how we need to measure out our accomplishments here at Annunciation, not by impressive new facilities or even a surplus operating budget. While these may be expressions of a dynamic parish, they must not compromise the only goal that matters, the why we are here, to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the Father the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Do this, and we will see each other's weaknesses as yet an another glorious manifestation of God's love and power. May his name be glorified now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.